I am very excited to introduce Dr. Dominique Pichard, Chief Science Officer with RetSyndrome.org, who's going to steer us through our journey today with our amazing group of researchers at UC Davis. So um, Dr. Pichard, if you would like to go ahead and, and um, give our opening remarks. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Paige. And uh, thank you to everyone for registering uh, for today's uh, session. It is really going to be an exciting session where we have two excellent researchers. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Kyle Fink uh, and a graduate student with Dr. Kyle Fink, uh, Mr. Uh, Julian Halmey. So today they're going to talk about gene therapy, crispr cas potential for Rett syndrome. Uh, and just to give you a little bit of background about our two uh, speakers today, uh, Dr. Fink, uh, he did his academic training and uh, achieved his research experience. Um, as a graduate student, he researched, his research focused on therapeutic potential of genetically engineered stem cells. And this work was performed on an international fellowship that was provided by the French Embassy of Science and Technology to work with a neuroimmunology group uh, in a lab in France. So now the Fink Lab focuses on therapeutic development of gene modifying modalities, such as zinc fingers, transcription activator-like effectors, and CRISPR-Cas9 to treat genetically linked neurologic disorders. Dr. Fink's key interest in this field involves understanding the therapeutic benefit in human cellular models of disease, functional efficacy in transgenic rodent models, and optimization of delivery modalities in clinically relevant models. The Fink Lab is developing gene-modifying therapies for multiple single gene disorders, including Rett syndrome. Along with uh, Dr. Fink, we have, as I mentioned, a fourth-year graduate student in the Integrative Genetics and Genomics graduate group uh, who is working under the mentorship of Dr. Kyle Fink. Um, this is Julian Halmi. So prior to joining the Fink Lab, Julian received his bachelor's degree as well as a master's degree from the Netherlands. He received a prestigious fellowship uh, to train at UC Davis in the laboratory of David Siegel, where he was introduced to Dr. Fink. Julian's outstanding work has garnered him many awards, uh, such as a prestigious junior fellowship award given by the Lulu Foundation. In his work, uh, he is focused on adapting CRISPR in a translational manner for genetically linked neurodevelopmental disorders, such as CDKL5 deficiency and Rett syndrome. He is interested in altering the epigenetic landscape of the target gene by means of epigenetic effector domains and analyze its impact on gene expression. Uh, so with this, uh, I want to welcome both of you to this webinar and thank you very much for sharing your expertise with us today. I think that we have a very engaged group who's excited to hear more from you directly. So welcome and thank you. Thank you for the uh, wonderful introduction and, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to share um, some of the current work that's going on uh, in our lab. And so, uh, can everybody see our uh, slides and our screen right now? Yes, we I can. Thank you. Up. Okay. Um, and again, thank you uh, to Paige for organizing this and, and for um, giving us the opportunity to talk. I think one of the things that uh, really helps drive a little bit of our, our passion and, and what we do in the laboratory um, is really having the opportunity to speak with, um, you know, uh, organizations such as RetSyndrome.org and, and kind of sharing and trying to convey hopefully the, the cool science that we're doing um, to, a, to a broader audience. And so um, we've been working with RetSyndrome.org for, for a little over 18 months now and I've had the opportunity to do some of the other education days in which we get to meet the patients and the families. Um, and really start to understand the, the, the disorder from a personal level, um, which I think makes a huge impact for the lab and, and kind of as we start to move these things forward. Um, so again, we're extremely grateful um, for this opportunity to, to share our work. And I know Julian is also um, very excited to, to talk about some of the novel stuff that he's working on. Yeah, thank you so much uh, to the organizers and for the nice introduction, Dominique. Um, I'm very excited to kind of share my passion about epigenetics with you not only how we can look at it from a basic research perspective, but also how we can actually translate it into a um, potential therapeutic. And together with Kyle and the expertise that we have over here and kind of the resources that we have at, at the uh, stem cell program, um, this is going to be very exciting. Great, thank you. So um, we wanted to kind of give a, a little bit of an overview. And so um, 
uh, I'm uh, housed or uh, my faculty position here at UC Davis. I've been at UC Davis for uh, um, almost Dr. seven Fink? years now. Yes. Dr. Fink, I'm sorry, I'm getting some feedback from the audience that the audio isn't as clear as it could be. I'm wondering if you can get a little closer to your microphone. Okay, is that better? Uh, why don't you try speaking just a little bit and we'll see. Okay, um, hopefully, hopefully we're coming in a little bit clearer now. Yeah, that's a little bit better. Um, if anyone is not getting better audio, send me a chat. We'll see what we can do. Okay, and we'll, we'll try to uh, speak loudly and, and clearly so everybody, everybody can hear us. Um, and so again, uh, we're housed in the, the stem cell program uh, at UC Davis at our uh, School of Medicine campus and in a building called the Institute for Regenerative Cures. Um, and then uh, I'm, my faculty appointment's actually in our Department of Neurology. Uh, and then we're a, a stem cell program, we're an Institute for Regenerative Cures, and, and recently we have also became a gene therapy center. So um, a lot of the topics that I think uh, we're going to cover today, uh, we have a lot of institutional backing and a lot of uh, institutional support to try to advance these uh, towards therapeutic uh, interventions. And so uh, as a brief overview of what we're gonna talk about today, uh, uh, we kind of covered the introductions. Uh, I'm going to introduce a little bit about uh, UC Davis and kind of the resources that we have available um, here. And, and these are resources that I think are very valuable as we start to develop um, novel interventions for genetically linked uh, disorders such as Rett syndrome. Um, the different things that we can do uh, within our center that hopefully we can uh, take something from an idea uh, that we have that we can test uh, on a lab bench uh, move that through uh, animal studies, through uh, manufacturing and scalability, and then hopefully one day walk it across to our, our main hospital and, and provide some uh, meaningful interventions. I'll also cover a little bit um, about gene therapy. And so gene therapy, I think, uh, is in the middle of a, a, um, a renaissance right now. It's, it's, it's really coming back and, and, and making a, a huge impact um, in the lives of, of many people. And I think the, the thought of what gene therapy is and the promise of what gene therapy is, is amazing. But I also wanna cover a little bit about the, some of the different uh, aspects of gene therapy, um, the different types of gene therapy, and, and kind of provide a little bit of information and background um, kind of over what to deliver, how things are delivered, the manner in which they're delivered, and then um, touch a little bit on, on what we think about how these, these types of novel therapeutics um, will we'll be fine in the, you know, in the next 15 to 20 years, maybe where we are. Um, and then we're gonna switch over and talk about some other uh, newer or more current technologies that fit within the world of gene therapy. Um, and this is doing really things like uh, targeted gene modification. And this is something that our lab is, is extremely focused on and extremely excited about. Um, and this is using uh, these different things that we'll refer to as DNA binding domains uh, that can actually recognize specific sequences of DNA with uh, really uh, precise um, abilities. And, and uh, these DNA binding domains present a very cool opportunity of ways in which we can use them. And I'll, and I'll cover a little bit about the different aspects of, of how we can use zinc fingers or TALS um, and CRISPR-Cas9. And then I'm going to turn it over uh, to let Julian speak for a little bit about uh, his very exciting work. Uh, uh, with regards to Rett syndrome and the approach that he's taking for Rett syndrome um, and really this idea and this concept of what we consider epigenetic editing. And so uh, we hope that um, uh, this will kind of, uh, my talk will lay a little bit of the groundwork and provide some terminology and then Julian will uh, provide some very cool uh, upcoming science and, and very current and, and uh, fun technologies that we can use to hopefully make an impact um, in, in devastating disorders such as Rett syndrome. And then we'll close a little bit with, with a summary, um, kind of what we talked about, what we think about in terms of future perspectives, where we maybe are within the landscape of uh, performing this work. And so, um, you know, things maybe uh, feel like they move very quickly in the lab, but we also understand that um, it, it may never move fast enough for, for, the, for the families and the patients that are, that are affected by these things. And so um, a little bit of, of you know, where we are, where we think that we're going and, and you know, potentially what the potential for what this will be uh, as we move forward. Um, and so again, I wanted to cover a little bit over uh, who we are. Um, for those that may not know about our lab or about uh, UC Davis itself, 
Um, and so we're kind of this bubble uh, in the stem cell program and, and part of UC Davis. And uh, we're part of UC Davis Health. So we're actually in uh, Sacramento where our School of Medicine is located, uh, housed within a, 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 a large converted uh, brick building uh, that used to be part of uh, state fairs and then became a, a home for medical records and now uh, is the home of extremely cool science that's going on for a lot of various dis uh, diseases and disorders. Um, and then and we've gotten uh, very fortunate to, to be funded by the California Institute for Regenerative Medicine to not only renovate this building um, that we're, we basically live in uh, to perform this work, but also uh, money for, for different um, disease indications that uh, we're trying to move forward. And so uh, we can kind of see the, the broad range of what we do uh, within the, the stem cell program itself. Um, the, the blue circle up here on the top uh, is kind of the world that my lab lives in. And so um, very focused on, on developing uh, therapeutics for genetically linked neurological disorders uh, with Rett syndrome being one of our very large uh, disease indications and platforms that we're trying to study. Uh, but one of the very cool things is, is all of these different disease teams are only about an arm's reach away from us. And so while we are developing things uh, for neurological disorders, uh, we have great collaborators that are maybe um, coming up with very cool and novel techniques um, in one of these other indications. And we can kind of leverage that tool and leverage that expertise um, from the outside to, to make an impact and help accelerate what we're trying to do. Um, and like I said, again, the stem cell program uh, kind of exists uh, within UC Davis. And UC Davis itself, um, I think a lot of people don't necessarily know, um, has an extremely large and diverse um, faculty and a very large and diverse uh, centers of expertise. And so uh, we have one of the top uh, veterinary schools. Usually um, we're ranked in the top three, I think, uh, typically. Um, the Department of Neurology, where, where I'm, uh, my academic appointment is housed. We have uh, neurosurgeons that do amazing work. Um, and then one of the other things that I think that's very exciting to, to have for us specifically is, is um, the MIND Institute. And the MIND Institute is a, a collection of clinicians and researchers who focus on developmental disorders um, and anything that kind of falls within the autism spectrum disorder uh, world. And, and uh, we interact a lot with the clinicians and they have genetic counselors and they have basic uh, scientists and researchers that are trying to understand uh, not only genes that are causative for different diseases, um, but also pathways and, and targets for this. And so um, it's really been a great benefit to us to be able to walk over and, and interact with these experts um, and clinicians to, to help us understand and, and kind of frame what our work is um, in the context of, uh, you know, not, not how do our cells look uh, in a dish that we're looking at on a microscope, but how do these cells in a dish relate to, you know, maybe what somebody is experiencing um, at the clinical world or, or, you know, as they're, as they're being looked at. And then of course, uh, even in the broader, broader, uh, spectrum, um, you know, we, we kind of follow the leadership missions at, uh, at UC Davis. And we're very fortunate that, uh, the new Dean of our school of medicine is a movement disorder neurologist who's very focused on, uh, genetically linked disorders that affect, um, uh, children. And so uh, we have a lot of support basically within UC Davis as a whole uh, to develop these things for genetically linked disorders, specifically neurodevelopmental diseases, um, as well as cell and gene therapy. Um, and then uh, we like to do or we frame a lot of our work um, in terms of education. And then like what we're doing today, which I think is one of the, the very cool perks of our job is, is getting to interact with the community. Um, and for us to be able to kind of convey, you know, what our passion is, what we're doing, um, you know, where we think that we're going and what we're doing and, and to be able to talk to, um, you know, uh, people that are, are, you know, living this and, 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 and um, experiencing these things every day. Um, and so a little bit more about uh, the Institute for Regenerative Cures uh, and the stem cell program itself. And so uh, it's a very large facility. We have about uh, between anywhere uh, from about 150 to 200 different research faculty uh, that are all focused on developing uh, interventions and therapeutics. Um, the building itself was, was specifically renovated and designed by uh, my mentor, one of my mentors, um, and really good colleagues and, and amazing people, uh, Jan Nolta. And she really got to kind of uh, take this blank slate of a building and design it in a way that she thought was going to help um, accelerate translation and uh, help accelerate interventions for um, disease research. 
And so we have uh, a lot of, and I'll touch on in the, in the next slide, a lot of these different cores. Um, and one of the ones that I really wanted to highlight are these, these pictures of the people in the, in the white, uh, we call them bunny suits, but these, um, these uh, very specialized uh, staff and uh, researchers work in our good manufacturing practice facility. And our good manufacturing practice facility uh, is the place that we go to, to test things um, directly before we go to the clinic. Um, and so in a good manufacturing practice facility, uh, these are extremely clean rooms. Um, and so uh, they measure things in terms of uh, particulates per cubic meter. Um, and basically the, the FDA and regulatory agencies have a very strict threshold um, for the level of, of things that you could have basically in the, the atmospheric air. And our GMP facility is one of the, the cleanest places I think that you could possibly be. Um, and what they can do here is they can manufacture cells, they can manufacture uh, gene therapy vectors, they can manufacture and engineer uh, cells using those vectors. Uh, and then basically anything that, that is manufactured within this GMP undergoes a very rigorous uh, quality assurance and quality control. Uh, and then these therapies can be walked over to the hospital and administered into patients. And so uh, currently we have um, a lot of about 41 different clinical trials uh, that's ongoing or that are ongoing right now that the manufacturing is being done in this uh, this GMP facility. And so I think as a resource for uh, people like me and people that work in my lab, having the ability to go um, uh, 15 feet and talk to these experts uh, in terms of scalability and in terms of doing clinical trials uh, is really quite an amazing resource. And so uh, kind of within the, the spectrum and the um, uh, the pathway that we have here at UC Davis, uh, we hope that we can take things all the way from the bench uh, to the bedside, and that's really one of our dreams. And one of the ways that we're able to do that through our translational lab um, is through this, uh, these really wonderful uh, core services. And so these core services all kind of function as um, their own uh, little industries. And uh, we use these a lot, and so why, uh, Julian is an outstanding, very dedicated researcher who's, who's here all the time. Um, There's certain things that um, are very time consuming that would maybe distract him from doing some of the other very cool work. And so um, things like developing uh, viral vectors or growing stem cells um, from a patient that has Rett syndrome, you know, this may be a project that takes several months to do. And we can basically give that to an expert uh, specifically that understands how to make an, uh, a cell called an induced pluripotent stem cell that we can take from uh, a skin biopsy from a patient, grow these very cool cells, differentiate those into things that look like neurons, and then test therapeutics in. And so all of these different uh, core services really kind of help accelerate our research in which we can uh, interact with them uh, to really help move our research forward. Uh, some of the other cores, we have regulatory cores because we have a lot of people that are doing the same translational work. And our regulatory core is really uh, has uh, a lot of internal expertise in terms of how we interact with the FDA. Um, when do we interact? When do we have type, you know, what type of call should we have with the FDA? When should we file uh, certain documents with the FDA? And then also the preparation of those documents. Um, and so through through all of the these different core services, uh, you know, specifically like the SEMSO core, our regulatory core, our good manufacturing practice facility. Um, you know, it really gives us a lot of hope that uh, if we make a really uh, meaningful impact or breakthrough within a disease indication that we can we can leverage these core services uh, to really move forward. Um, and then the, uh, one of the other very cool things, again, uh, I, I very much enjoy my job and I love where I'm working uh, here at UC Davis, um, is that the, the California Institute for Regenerative Medicine had a great idea several years ago uh, to institute this, um, this network called the Alpha Clinics. Um, and what these Alpha Clinics actually uh, are able to do, so this is a state-funded uh, network, uh, and you can see the, the different uh, medical centers listed down here in the, in the lower right corner, um, City of Hope, UCLA, UCI, UC San Diego, UCSF, um, and us here at UC Davis, is uh, if we are able to get a clinical trial initiated, uh, using cells or gene therapy, um, all of these, uh, we basically are not serving as an independent standalone medical center anymore. We're able to access the network of, of patients and resources and manufacturing um, basically across the entire state of California. 
And so uh, this network actually does some very cool things in terms of having uh, what's called an IRB, these kind of centralized network-wide IRB agreements, um, which allow us to, to identify patients in, in different regions. Um, and then also, I think one of the very cool things is the, the implementation or implement of uh, telemedicine. And so what this means is, is if you live in uh, San Diego, but there's a clinical trial going on here at UC Davis, you may, be, you may come up to have the, the initial intervention performed, um, but then all of your follow-up visits could be performed at UC Davis. And you would, you would talk over telemedicine, over webcasts, uh, similar to how we're talking today, uh, with the with the medical experts in that field or if, uh, within that arena, and so this really I think helps ease the burden on on patients that are enrolled in clinical trials, and and the alpha the alpha uh, stem cell clinics um, at least here at UC Davis has kind of revolutionized the way in which we're delivering um, cell and gene therapy uh, uh, trials that are you know and a lot of these are are life saving uh, type interventions. Um, that are now now being run out of out of our center here at the Institute for Regenerative Cures in UC Davis, um, and which we think is 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 extremely exciting. Um, and so we're going to dive a little bit more into kind of how we think about our research and and, and defining some of these different terms. Um, and so one of the things that that we use a lot and what we think about a lot in our lab. Um, is and so Julian in his introduction is a uh, he's trained as a geneticist and as uh, somebody who understands genomics and genetics and their interactions and how they contribute to diseases. Um, my training in neuroscience and then uh, and then later uh, during my postdoc uh, in terms of understanding genetics um, kind of help really shape about how we think about genetic information in medicine. And uh, we're kind of at this, again, these, these uh, very cool intersects in, in terms of time that uh, the amount of genetic information that we can collect from, from patient populations um, is growing uh, extremely fast every day. And so the ability to do whole exome sequencing or whole genome sequencing to understand if there's a causative mutation that, that leads to a a functional phenotype or a functional behavioral change um, is becoming a lot more standard and a lot more normal to do. Um, but we kind of think of, uh, of how we use this genetic information um, and we use this triangle over on the on the left. And so a lot of times for those that have done things like Ancestry.com or 23andMe or any of these other services um, that you can do a cheek swab and you can send in information and get back a lot of genetic information about yourself, um, you basically get uh, a huge number of variants that are of uncertain or unknown significance. Um, you also get an extremely large uh, data set of things that may be probabilistic. And so things that may look like risk factors or certain traits. Um, and these depend on kind of different polymorphisms that exist. And I think if, um, you know, a lot of times people get, get the readouts from these different services and say, Oh, this is cool. I have X percent increase uh, to be um, an Olympic swimmer, but you also maybe have an X percent decrease of being an, you know. So, um, how these different types of factors actually play into to functional genetics um, is a little bit hard for us to discern today. These are these are very uh, genetics and epigenetics are very complex. Uh, interactions between uh, what's going on genetically, what goes on in your environment, and how all these different mutations and factors and variants uh, lead to function. Uh, and so really where uh, we exist in, as a lab for the most part uh, are in these deterministic uh, uh, genetic information. And so these are things uh, like with MECP2 that we know if there are uh, variants in MECP2 um, that lead to a loss of function, that that, that individual will likely develop um, symptoms that look very similar to Rett syndrome, or they will have Rett syndrome. Um, and a lot of these deterministic uh, uh, genetic information that we get today, um, you know, it, I think it is a challenge. I think it's always a relief to understand that, you know, the, the behavioral changes that we see may be linked to a specific change in the DNA. But unless there's something out there uh, that can inform a clinical decision, um, you know, a lot of these deterministic things may become with ethical concerns, may become, um, you know, with uh, with different challenges. 
in terms of how we use this information, how do we move this information forward. And so really what we want to do, um, which we see at the, the top of this triangle, um, which unfortunately has the fewest number of cases, is using genetic information to make, uh, to have actionable choices, to inform a clinical decision. So you may have a mutation in a certain gene, but then how do we use that information to treat whatever deficits may be or whatever symptoms or whatever behavioral changes uh, may be occurring. And so hopefully in the next several years, uh, this triangle will not look like a triangle. It will maybe invert um, or, or at least the top of it will broaden, broaden out a lot. Um, and so again, really the focus of my lab and, and our collaborators here, um, uh, here at the Institute for Genetic Cures as well as in the Genome Center uh, with our great collaborator, David Siegel, is how can we use genetic information to, or how do we use this genetic information to then treat um, the causative genes? And so we're really hoping to be able to take these deterministic factors and make actionable decisions. And so I think as we start to move forward, um, and as gene therapy and, and, and these different types of things start to become more and more prevalent, um, that we'll be able to take a lot of these deterministic factors and make them, make them actionable. Um, and so I'm just going to do a very quick uh, back to uh, kind of basic biology or, or uh, high school level biologies. Um, and this is just to kind of frame a lot of our discussions, I think, as we move forward in terms of what we think of um, for what therapeutics are on the horizon and what's being tested clinically and other, other conditions and uh, are in the pipeline at some level for Rett syndrome. And so uh, at the most basic level, uh, we have DNA. We have 3.3 billion base pairs of uh, DNA that codes for about 20, a little over 22,000 um, genes. And these genes uh, in the coding region of the DNA make uh, RNA or this, this messenger RNA uh, that then uh, make a protein. And so the protein is, is going to be one of the things that kind of leads to different function um, of the cell or the, the actual thing that the cell or the gene will do um, within our cells. And so as we start to think about these different types of um, these different levels, you can think about different ways in which we could try to develop uh, interventions. And so uh, in terms of protein, uh, different things that I think are, are out there uh, in terms of Rett syndrome and, and how, we can, how we can think about this loss of function of, of the gene called MECP2, how can we restore the function of this protein? Um, and so these may be through small molecules, ways in which we can increase the production of, of the good MECP2. Um, can we use antibody drugs to, to modulate um, the, the protein? Can we use enzyme replacement therapy if we think that um, the cells only have, um, you know, or the, the brain, and we'll talk about this uh, later on specifically with Rett syndrome, you know, if it has 50% of what's needed, is there a way that we can just deliver more of the good protein or the healthy protein, the functional protein, back into the cells uh, in a controlled way? And so these, these are things that are, are enzyme replacement therapies in which we basically deliver the protein um, uh, continuously. Um, unfortunately, uh, even with all the progress in, in uh, small molecule drugs and um, drug development pipelines um, and all the, the, the commercially available and FDA approved drugs, um, you know, it's, it's uh, around 14% of all proteins are actually druggable. And so um, while it's great if we can find something that interacts specifically with protein, um, this can be a, a challenge and, and it can take many years um, and a lot of money to try to develop these, these different approaches. Uh, secondly, we can go after targeting RNA um, specifically. And so there's ways in which we can use things like RNA interference or antisense oligonucleotides or ASOs. Um, and so I think a lot of people are, are familiar and hearing about ASOs. Um, in Rett syndrome, these are very interesting uh, types of interventions in that they're maybe not specifically targeting uh, MECP2 directly, but they're targeting things that keep uh, one copy or a healthy copy of ME MECP2 silent. And so using these different types of things and functioning at the, the RNA level um, may have potential in terms of kind of unlocking or releasing the expression um, of the, the non-variant uh, MECP2 um, that, that um, uh, patients would have. And then last uh, is how do we, how do we use the, the genetic information or the DNA specifically? How can, can we target things kind of at uh, the level of where dysfunction may be occurring or where the variants may be occurring. 
Um, and so I put gene therapy down in the DNA section. Um, it may also, we could, we could push it, I should have maybe put it in the middle between DNA and RNA. Um, in that gene therapy, uh, and we'll define this uh, shortly in, in terms of what the clinical success has been, is we can take basically the region of DNA or the gene, um, the coding region of that gene, and we can put it in something uh, which is basically a very modified virus um, or viral vector. And then when we put that back into the cell, it's able to produce RNA and protein uh, to restore function. Um, gene editing, I think, is also taking uh, a lot of the world by storm right now. The, the uh, rapid advances that are being done with CRISPR-Cas9 uh, to actually go in and, and, and cut the DNA and change the DNA um, or try to fix the DNA um, is also uh, making progress, especially in things like uh, disorders of, of blood cells, um, things like sickle cell anemia um, come to mind. And so these have very exciting uh, potential. Um, but we'll touch a little bit on, on later, and I think some of the questions that, that we were able to see uh, written in, uh, we can talk a little bit about, you know, maybe what we think about uh, in terms of cutting the DNA specifically uh, in the brain or in a neuron. Uh, and then again, one of the things that we're the most excited about as a lab um, is this idea of epigenetic editing. And so um, we can kind of think of uh, loosely defining epigenetics as, as everything that uh, kind of modifies the DNA without changing the base pairs of the DNA, the actual sequence of the DNA. And so epigenetics are a way in which uh, our body kind of regulates uh, which genes are expressed in certain cells and which genes are uh, not expressed in certain cells. Um, and Julian will cover this in a lot more detail, but um, we can kind of think of epigenetics as why we can have the same DNA in a skin cell that we have in a brain cell, but our skin cell is functioning very different than our brain. Um, in terms of uh, in skin, all the brain genes are, are turned off or downregulated, um, and the skin cell genes are, are on, and in our brain, all the brain cell genes um, are on and all the skin cell genes are, are off. And we can, we can leverage this uh, idea of epigenetics of how our body naturally regulates uh, the DNA for expressing RNA and making protein, um, and we can try to leverage that for uh, developing uh, therapeutics and interventions. And so to define a little bit further uh, what we think about it in terms of gene therapy, and gene therapy uh, has been around for um, uh, a little over or, you know, 30 plus years, people have been really understanding how we use um, or how we can use gene therapy uh, to treat uh, disorders and how we can use this for, for specifically genetically linked diseases. Um, and so uh, gene therapy has gone through uh, many kind of peaks and valleys, I would say, over this, this time period. Um, but some very dedicated, very brilliant scientists um, really had a strong belief that um, gene therapy held amazing potential. Um, and so in our picture over here on the left, uh, we can see some of these different uh, modalities. And so uh, I think the one that's the most common that people are hearing about is an adeno-associated virus, or AAV, um, more commonly used to engineer uh, cells, so like things that are happening uh, in the world of, of blood cancers using like a CAR-T therapeutic, um, are engineering cells using lentiviral vectors. And then again, we have our gene editing complex here because um, we really like gene, gene editing complexes in these DNA binding domains, and you can see how that's altering DNA itself. Um, and so for a little bit about AAV and a little bit of background on, on AAV, and so AAV, um, or these adeno-associated viruses, um, have the ability, they're, they're single-stranded RNA viruses that uh, we can basically engineer or have been engineered um, over the last 30 years to, to take out the, the dangerous parts of a virus um, and so we can think of things like the common cold and how the common cold gets into your cells and continues to spread and, and propagate amongst, amongst itself. We can take those same viruses that maybe cause um, like a cold and we can, engineer, we can engineer those vectors. And so we can take out the things, um, you know, like the, the viral genome, the things that are uh, potentially causing uh, harm, and we can, we can basically take those out. Um, of these viral backbones. Uh, we can change and we can engineer lots of different parts about the, the AAV itself, um, even giving it the, the potential to have a preference for what type of cell it wants to go into. Um, so if we wanted to go um, more preferentially to a neuron in the brain, uh, there are certain ways in which we can make the virus to have it have a little bit of 
uh, what we call tropism or the, um, the ability to be attracted to going into brain cells specifically. Um, and and uh, the, this wonderful review written, uh, oh, I guess uh, almost two years ago now, um, where it really talks about gene therapy coming of age. Uh, and I think this is um, uh, a lot of the, the stories of these, these brilliant uh, authors that are on the, um, the title here about how uh, they've followed the ups and downs of gene therapy um, over the last several decades and, and really highlighted by um, market approval of, of a couple of different AAV interventions. One um, from, uh, from the CHOP uh, and now Spark Therapeutics, um, uh, which is a, an AAV compound called Luxerna, which uh, uh, cures or functionally cures a form of genetic blindness. And so uh, people that um, were missing a very specific gene in, in, the, um, in the cells within the, the eye or within the retina, um, when, they, when they put this virus into the eye and into those cells and express the gene, uh, people that were, were not able to see were uh, regain their ability to um, to see clearly or, or their vision drastically improved. And this was the first AAV that was approved by, by the FDA or one of the, the to the market approval. Um, another one that I think is very exciting um, and gives a lot of hope, I think, to, to developmental disorders um, is, is kind of the storied history of what's going on with uh, Zolgensma. And so Zolgensma is an AAV um, that was developed by a company called the Vexus that was later acquired um, or partnered with uh, a large company called Novartis uh, to specifically treat uh, a disorder, a single gene disorder called uh, spinal muscular atrophy. And so in the most severe form of uh, spinal muscular atrophy, um, the, or, or has been uh, historically referred to as, as floppy baby syndrome. And so kids uh, basically never uh, develop muscle tone um, and then unfortunately have a, an extremely truncated lifespan of about 24 months. And so uh, through some very dedicated and, and long and winding research roads, uh, uh, some, some academic scientists that uh, ended up forming the company of Exus were able to come up with an AAV strategy in which they could replace the gene um, that was lacking in uh, SMA uh, and deliver this into patients and uh, drastically improve the lifespan. And so these are all very new things that are occurring um, or currently, um, you know, um, Zolgensma uh, had market approval for a little bit and then due to, due to some unforeseen circumstances it is back on clinical hold where they're trying to kind of figure out um, what their next steps are to, to make sure that this is approved and, and is it going to be able to go to all patients that need it. Um, and so these, uh, these two examples of, of AAV or gene therapy, um, I think have drastically improved the quality of life um, of those suffering from this genetic form of blindness or this uh, very early developmental disorder that uh, caused a truncated lifespan. And so I think these, these examples give a lot of hope um, kind of over the safety and over what we think of in terms of the regulatory pipeline um, to push gene therapy forward for something like Rett syndrome. Um, and then kind of as we think about gene therapy, I think uh, one of the things that we very much have to consider is um, we're getting very good as scientists as, as, uh, in terms of curing diseases when they exist in a petri dish in our lab. And so the ability to treat uh, cells uh, that are growing um, in a plastic flask or a plastic dish uh, that live in one of our incubators, uh, we have very good access to these cells. However, um, it's, it's, that's not relevant to, to patients or to, to those um, that are in need of the therapy. And so I think one of the things that we really have to start to consider is how do we deliver these very uh, potent, very powerful, um, and very impactful types of therapeutics uh, to patients. And so with AAV, this is something that's a little bit more direct delivery. And so we can see in this, this diagram of our um, pink person here on the right, uh, that if there is a, a gene that is missing, um, like in MECP2 or in Rett syndrome, uh, we can take this, the coding region of this gene and add it into a viral vector such as AAV, uh, that, then we can directly inject that into a person. Um, for a lot of different disorders, uh, delivering this uh, IV or delivering this uh, directly to an organ um, may have a lot of uh, benefit and potential. 
I think one of the things as a neuroscientist and as somebody that's uh, tried to, to develop therapies for the brain for the um, almost the entirety of my career, um, accessing the brain is, is relatively challenging and relatively difficult. Um, there are uh, studies that have happened with, with AAV where they have directly injected them into the brain, um, but these require relatively invasive surgeries. And I think um, as we think about developmental disorders or diseases that um, affect children, this is something that we really have to take into account is, is, is balancing the risk and the benefit of uh, very invasive surgeries to directly inject into a developing brain um, versus alternative approaches. Um, and then over on the right side of this picture, um, I put this in here for cell-based deliveries um, because I think this is, this is something that's also extremely exciting in, in the way in which we can engineer cells uh, using lentiviral vectors uh, then to treat and, and to, to help um, uh, either treat or prevent um, uh, diseases and disorders. And so this is a way in which um, here in this example, we can take out a patient's uh, stem cells um, from the body. And so in this case, we take them from uh, the blood. Um, we can engineer those cells uh, to, to have the missing gene and then give back to the person uh, following what we call like a conditioning regimen, which allow these, uh, these types of stem cells to um, live in the patient for a very long time. And I think one of the, the best success stories of this um, is from uh, a researcher in Southern California named Don Cohn, um, who really followed the, the ups and the downs and the trials and tribulations of gene therapy and se uh, stem cell gene therapy um, to uh, deliver a gene uh, that was um, causing uh, bubble baby syndrome or, or severe compromised immune deficiency or SCID. And so these patients that did not have a functioning immune system, they, they came up with a, a pipeline and, and protocols in which they could take uh, these, these immune forming cells out, engineer them to express all the genes that are needed to make a complete immune system, give them back to the patients. And now these kids that have been living um, basically in quarantine are out, you know, playing and running around and having fun um, and, and, you know, starting to, to the, um, have a more normal childhood. And so I think these, these examples really give a lot of hope for what we think of in terms of gene therapy. And we can learn a lot from these, uh, these different trials that are ongoing in terms of the safety, in terms of the delivery, in terms of the, you know, how long do they last? Is this a one-time delivery for the life of the patient? Do we have to do multiple deliveries? Um, and then how do we start to, to use all of that information uh, to develop a safe therapeutic for, for a safe and a meaningful therapeutic for RET syndrome? Um, and so with that, uh, we're gonna transition into kind of maybe what we think of the, uh, a little bit more in terms of the current technologies. And so we're gonna talk a little bit about something called DNA binding domains. Um, and so DNA binding domains um, are these, these different types of proteins and, and targeting um, uh, factors in which we can start to, to identify and bind to very specific regions of, of DNA. And so out of those 3.3 billion base pairs, um, almost every gene has a very unique region um, associated with it, a region that is not uh, is only found within that gene or within that, that specific sequence, um, which is really incredible to think about how, how our bodies develop to, to be so unique for every, every different gene. Um, and so how we use these DNA binding domains is, is we can use those as tools. And so um, on the left, you can see this video that um, is maybe uh, made from a, 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 a an AAV or AV service that um, is a little bit older. And then on the right, uh, a very cool video made about Cas9. And so on the left, this is a transcription activator like Effector. And, and you can kind of start to uh, maybe see and appreciate this, this double-stranded DNA um, that the tall is, is basically bouncing around the genome until it finds the match that it likes and then grabs a hold of it tightly. Um, and then on the right, the upper right here, we can see this video that looks like it has a giant, um, maybe a mushroom surrounding this double-stranded DNA. And again, uh, much cooler looking DNA from, from the video or from the group that made this video. Um, we can see these complex that are basically recognizing uh, specific sequences of DNA. Uh, and so this red strand here, this is called a, a guide RNA. And so this is a thing that basically uh, recognizes base pairs um, or recognizes specific uh, uh, strands of, of a sequence within a gene and then recruits this, the, the big mushroom looking thing, which is the, uh, the Cas protein, in, in this case, Cas9. And so what we can see here is, is, as this video continues to play, 
uh, the recognition has occurred, Cas9 has been recruited to this site, and then we see this little uh, bright flash of light um, in which a, a double-stranded break of the DNA occurs. Um, and so in, in nature, uh, Cas9 actually is a domain that uh, results in uh, double-stranded breaks and, and, and breaking the DNA. And we can use this, and this is kind of, I think, the terminology that we think of in terms of uh, um, gene editing. And so editing meaning that we're actually cutting the DNA um, and then uh, potentially trying to do things like a cut and paste approach in which following a cut of the DNA, uh, we can then go in and, and try to repair it with the correct sequence. And so if we think of, of different genetic disorders or uh, of diseases that may have a single, uh, a single letter of the DNA that is incorrect that's causing the dysfunction, uh, gene editing uh, may seem like a very attractive approach that we can go in and just try to switch that letter. Um, and so we can we can rapidly synthesize these different targets to, to recognize different base pair sequences, different genes, different regions of the genes. Um, they're pretty efficient. Um, they're very or they have a lot of specificity. Um, but one of the things that I think that we think about a lot, uh, specifically in the world of gene editing. Um, is this idea of, of off-target effects. And so off-target effects mean that we may be really good at recognizing that one unique sequence, but if, uh, you know, out of a thousand events that may occur, if 999 of them occur at the right site, but one of them occur at the wrong site, um, or another uh, place in the DNA, what impact is that going to have? And if it has a negative impact, um, you know, is that is that going to have um, you know, give rise to other types of complications. Um, and so one of the things that I think that we're very interested in as a lab is uh, using these DNA binding domains in a little bit more of a unique way. And so there's ways in which we can take out uh, the, this catalytically active area that actually causes the, the DNA to, to be cut. Um, and we can have these things basically recognize the DNA and, and bind. And so we still have the ability to very specifically target the DNA um, but then we can use uh, different types of approaches um, to regulate gene expression. And so this is something that uh, our lab and our collaborating labs um, have been focused on for uh, several years now of how we, how we best can do this. And so we can see kind of some of the different constructs over here on the left, our zinc fingers, our, our talls, and CRISPR-Cas9, but you can see that um, they all have the, the ability to cut DNA removed. And then we put in these uh, what we call effector domains. And what these effector domains are, are things again like what we talked about that exist naturally within our cells to regulate gene expression. And so we can see these videos playing over on the right corner in terms of activation and repression. And so these different factors and these different regulatory regions uh, exist naturally in, all, in our cells all the time already. And so what these activators do is they may land uh, close to a promoter or close to a, a region of, the, of a gene, and then they, they basically cause this uh, a polymerase um, to, to start making messenger RNA, and then this messenger RNA is going to be uh, translated into protein. And so uh, these different uh, colorful globs that we see floating around uh, are what we refer to as the effector domains. And so we can actually take these uh, and take the and synthesize them and then fuse them on the, the end of a DNA binding domain. And so now instead of, um, we can basically tell a gene activator um, where to go and what gene to function on. Um, and in the bottom here, we have uh, the, the inverse of this in that we can uh, repress different genes. And so uh, we can land these different repressor domains uh, in different regions around this uh, 3D architecture of, of our chromatin or of our DNA um, to, to shut off the uh, expression of a gene in, in different ways. And so uh, you can see that this can be done through blocking transcription, this can be through uh, tightly coiling up um, the, the DNA in, into these chromatin strands, um, and how we can start to use these and, and uh, learn from these natural regula uh, regulatory units uh, within a cell to develop a therapeutic. And so uh, in something like Rett syndrome, and Julian will cover this more specifically in, in his portion of the talk, is how do we start to use these uh, these different domains um, in a therapeutically relevant way for uh, a gene that exists on the X chromosome uh, that causes, causes Rett syndrome. 
Um, and so uh, with that, um, I'm gonna turn it over to, to Julian and let him uh, talk about uh, a little bit about uh, specifically what we're doing um, in the lab for Rett syndrome and, and uh, kind of his different approaches for epigenetic editing. Thank you so much, Kyle. Uh, of course, the majority of the attendees are very familiar with Rett syndrome. Um, I will still cover the basis a little bit in order to make our uh, approach a little bit um, more understandable. So um, Rett syndrome is a, a neurodevelopmental disorder that occurs almost exclusively in females. And as Kyle has mentioned earlier, it's caused by a mutation in the uh, MECB2 gene that usually causes a loss of function. Um, approximately one in 10,000 females in the United States are affected by Rett syndrome, and it's hallmarked by this um, by a regression of acquired skills, loss of speech, and stereotypic movements, specifically in the hands, as well as microcephaly, seizures, and mental regulation. That is happening between six and 18 months of age. Now, what's very interesting from a genetics perspective about Rett syndrome is that uh, there's a process occurring that's called random X chromosome inactivation. Uh, in, in the case of Rett syndrome, this uh, means that um, females that have a mutation, they will actually form a um, mosaic tissue of cells that express either the wild type allele, the healthy allele, or the mutant allele, because this is an X-linked gene. And I will cover this in a second in a little bit more detail. So um, this is very promising in the sense that actually there is still a healthy allele around, a healthy copy of the gene that potentially can be reactivated. Now, what's very tricky with um, MECB2 and Rett syndrome specifically is that MECB2 is actually a, what we would call a dosage-sensitive gene. So having too much um, MECB2 it can be detrimental, which will cause a duplication syndrome, as well as having too little will result in Rett syndrome. So actually kind of having this, this fine-tuning of gene expression for specifically extinct disorders such as Rett syndrome, MECB2, is very, very important. And we believe that um, the approach that our lab has come up with is very um, promising in that in that regard. Uh, we recently had a uh, paper published with me as the lead author on uh, targeting a different X chromosomal gene that is called CDKL5. CDKL5 is found on the short arm of the X chromosome in contrast to um, MECB2, which is found on the long arm. And what we're trying to do here basically is reactivating CDKL5 uh, in a very targeted fashion, which is then very applicable as well to other X-linked uh, genes. <clears throat> so just covering again a little bit of the basic biology. So we know that female somatic tissue can be, uh, can be mosaic. What that means is in a somatic cell, uh, randomly one of the X chromosomes becomes inactivated. And you can see that on the leftmost uh, graphical figure here, it forms this 150 million base pair glob of DNA that is basically inaccessible. Well, at least so we think that it's generally uh, the transcriptional machinery that usually makes RNA uh, has a very hard time working over there. While there is an accessible X uh, in somebody that is uh, in a healthy individual in tissues such as the brain, which you can see in the middle panel, this is actually not a problem because this results in a mosaic expression of either allele. So um, both of the healthy copies are on. However, if you have an, uh, an individual with Rett syndrome, what this result in is a um, mosaic of cells expressing either the wild type allele or the mutant allele. And this will cause the dysfunction, of course. So the underlying epigenetics, this is something that I am personally very interested in, uh, very fascinating when it comes to the inactive X chromosome. Um, so the inactive X, the X inactivation is mediated through the expression of this uh, long RNA construct um, called EXIST that will actually paint the entire to be inactivated X chromosome. And what it will do is on the way while painting the X chromosome, it actually recruits these factors um, that will cause the, um, the DNA of the X chromosome that is being inactivated to be tightly uh, uh, repressed and inaccessible. So there are certain factors that mediate this. One of them is called the polycomp repressive complex. And what you can see on the right side is the DNA winding around these uh, little balls. And these balls are um, what we call nucleosomes, and the nucleosomes allow the DNA to have an additional barrier of, of code, which is actually the epigenetics. So these, these uh, protein complexes have tails sticking out that can be modified. So um, the PRC complex in this case will actually deposit certain um, what we call histone marks that uh, cause silencing of the chromatin. 
And one other very important factor here that is being recruited through EXIST, through this long known coding RNA, is a DNMT3. DNMT3 is a um, protein that will actually methylate the uh, DNA of the inactive X chromosome. What this means is that um, DNA that is methylated in specific regions, this will actually be very, very inaccessible for transcription. And all of this will eventually result in what you saw on the leftmost panel of um, being the inactive X chromatin. What is very interesting from uh, nature, we actually know that 12 to 20% of these human hexing genes escape from X chromosome inactivation. So even though they are found in this bar body on the right that I showed you earlier, they still have a baseline expression. So uh, several of these genes. What is very fascinating from a biology perspective is that these, um, these genes that escape, that we call escapees, have a very certain signature associated with them. And I briefly touched on these histone proteins or nucleosomes that can be modified. And so what these, um, what these genes that escape from X chromosome inactivation actually show is that they're generally depleted for these histone marks that are found on um, genes that actually become inactivated, such as H3K27 trimethylation, which is again, one of these histone variants that is highly associated with the inactive X chromosome, and specifically one of the factors that is very, very highly correlated with the status of X chromosome inactivation. So the more you have of that, the more likely it is that your chromosome will basically be inactivated, is methylation of the gene promoters. So if a gene promoter on the inactive X is, is methylated, meaning that the actual nucleotides, not the, not the proteins that the DNA winds around, but the actual DNA, is highly methylated. These genes are very, very inaccessible and do not function uh, and are transcriptionally, transcriptionally uh, inert. Our lab has a very, very interesting toolbox that allows us to actually go in there and remodel these epigenetics. So um, this has been pioneered by um, one of the labs that I've been working with in the past in the Netherlands, by Mariana Rotz, uh, using zinc finger technology. Now that we heard a lot about Cas9 uh, coming of age, what we use here is actually is an inactivated version of Cas9. So as Carl introduced earlier, Cas9 can be thought of as these gene scissors, but in this case, actually all it does, it, it serves as a DNA binding domain. So it is a tool that can deliver a certain effective domain that we can fuse uh, onto the Cas9 protein and thereby direct it to the target site. If the target site were to be a a gene on the inactive X, such as MECB2, we could fuse an effector domain to it that would allow the DNA to become remodeled. And we could, we could do the remodeling in certain ways. We could, as I introduced earlier, uh, remodel some of these histone proteins. So we can remove repressive histone, um, histone marks from the DNA. We can add on active histone marks. So histone marks that are generally associated with a transcriptionally active gene. And most strikingly, what we can also do is remove DNA methylation through a pathway that has recently been discovered that will actually um, free up the DNA if you target it to the starting uh, points of the gene body. So um, what the paper that I recently published or that we recently published focused on are two factors. One of them is, again, this TED1 protein, which um, has been shown in the past for uh, fragile X syndrome, amongst other indications, to be uh, highly effective in removing DNA methylation and thereby actually reactivating gene expression. Um, and another factor that I will focus on in, in the next few slides is VP64. VP64 is a, what we call a strong transcriptional activator. So when this is targeted to a, a specific gene on the X chromosome, such as MECB2, what this would actually do is it would increase gene expression. So the only thing is that we don't know right now, uh, or, or we're a little bit struggling with uh, bio biology-wise, is that the uh, X chromosome is inactivated and therefore not necessarily accessible. So what I will show you in the, in the next slides is that when we actually have the TED1 come in first and thereby remove the DNA methylation, from the inactive X chromosome, um, landing VP64 uh, synergistically with TED1 will actually result in, um, in very nice reactivation 
in this case of the CDKL5 gene. Um, there's other work that has been done, pioneering work by some groups uh, at the MIT by Jeannie Lee and Michael Green that actually shows that uh, small molecule drugs targeting DNA methylation are very promising for Rett syndrome specifically in combination with the um, inhibition of the long non coding RNA exist. So these are ASO approaches. There's a mixed modality paper out there um, that actually shows um, very nice reactivation for MECP2 specifically. The only downside here is that these factors would work uh, genome-wide. Um, so you would possibly have unforeseeable uh, off-target effects happening through um, not only on the X chromosome by uh, global inactivation of the exist um, RNA, but also by inhibiting DNA methylation uh, throughout the entire cell. Um, our approach, what we hope to achieve with is, since it's highly targetable, we hope we can only reactivate gene of interest. So this is the, the strength here um, with the approach that we have recently published on. So what we actually find is that what you can see on the left, left side, on the inactive X chromatin, you see that the CDKL5 promoter, uh, what you can see here is highly methylated. So these are these little orange uh, um, um, balls and uh, the nucleosomes are tightly wound. So generally the this, this CDKL5 gene in this case is inactive. However, when we start um, transducing these cells. So kind of mentioned earlier, these are actually, uh, we can do a lot in petri dishes, thank God. And that's kind of where we need to start our work with. So this is the proof of principle that actually shows um, through delivery modalities that work very, very well in a dish that we can go in and deliver these large proteins with uh, these guide RNAs and actually start seeing effects on the gene expression of the inactive uh, gene. So in this case, on the top, when we target BP64 to the CDKL5 um, promoter, so the starting point of the gene, we actually see a very low reactivation happening just by binding of the Cas9 protein alone. So this, this Cas9 protein is a, a very large protein, so we believe that this is actually what um, confers this effect. When we um, add TED1 to the CDKL5 gene promoter, we actually see a 20% uh, or so reactivation of the gene. Uh, which is very, very exciting. Uh, and we actually find that this approach is um, highly specific to the intended target site. So um, this might be um, beneficial over small molecule drug approaches in that we can again only hit the target that we want and engage the target that we like. Um, and finally, what I kind of alluded to a little bit earlier is that a combinatorial treatment of this BP64 and TED1 together actually uh, shows us the strongest amount of reactivation. So um, this shows that these two factors seem to be working synergistically. Now, all of this has been done in a um, somewhat easy to work with cell line, and we are very excited to um, move this uh, forward in the future with actually patient-derived cells, as well as in vivo models for CDKL5, as well as um, Red syndrome. And I hand it back to Kyle. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, thank you, Julian, and 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 for, uh, for providing that information. And so I think one of the things that um, just as uh, we covered a lot, I think today over over gene therapy, over uh, DNA binding domains, over over kind of the pipeline of how we try to do uh, the work that we're doing. And so um, we kind of wanted to put a couple of summary slides up here before we before we start taking uh, questions. And so kind of as we think of uh, our lab and our program as a whole um, in developing stem cell and gene therapy uh, for, for disorders of the central nervous system, so things like Rett syndrome, um, is one is once we kind of identify a disorder that we think is a good uh, candidate, um, like Rett syndrome, something that is uh, caused by uh, variants within a single gene, uh, something that we think has uh, very much uh, promise for uh, epigenetic uh, interventions, but then we start to kind of work um, down through this pipeline and we can kind of follow the arrows from uh, identification of a disorder and obtaining, uh, we like to work as much as we can within the human genome. And so working with these uh, patient-derived samples, things like uh, uh, fibroblasts, which come from skin punch biopsies uh, that we can convert into, into different cell types. Um, like an induced pluripotent stem cell, um, but really with these, uh, starting within the human genome, what we can do is our next step is start to develop things um, in terms of designing these gene modifying domains. And so we can see the different uh, 
um, cartoon uh, representations of zinc fingers, transcription activator-like effectors, as well as, as Cas9. And so like Julian said, we can do these in the dish really well. And so kind of once we have our patient sample, we understand the genetic uh, landscape and, and the epigenetic landscape of what we're going to work in and what we're going to try to accomplish, then we can start moving them through these different in vitro models. And in vitro just basically means in our lab, uh, growing in a dish. And so uh, if there's transgenic mouse models that exist, and there's a lot of very cool and interesting mouse models of Rett syndrome, uh, we can actually take cells out of their brains and grow them. Um, that, that represent uh, neurons from, from the mouse containing the genetic information. Uh, like I said, we can make induced pluripotent stem cells. We can try to convert uh, patient fibroblasts directly into neurons. Um, we can differentiate induced pluripotent stem cells into neuronal-like cells. Um, so these are cells that come from the patient that get changed into a, a cell that has uh, the ability to become a lot of different types of cells. And then we can put it in specific conditions to try to make it look like uh, a neuron or a brain cell from a patient with Rett syndrome. Um, we also have a lot of projects going on and there's a lot of interest in the field in creating these things called organoids. And so we have uh, projects in our labs and then also collaborators um, in San Diego with Allison Mutri, who's making these very cool um, mini brains in a dish. And so ways in which we can take patient fibroblasts, turn them into iPSCs, and then you can start to grow them in these three-dimensional structures. And these three-dimensional structures um, basically start to make connections and the cells talk to each other uh, that maybe resemble a little bit closer to what we think of in terms of normal development and, and normal cell-to-cell -cell interactions. Um, and then kind of once we make it through this, um, this hurdle of the, the in vitro models, um, we think that what we're doing in a cell culture, we think that what we're doing in the patient cell lines um, has meaning, and we think that this, this is a very interesting uh, platform or approach for us, um, or a promising approach. Uh, then we start to try to address these, uh, um, the question of how do we actually test this? How do we actually access the brain? Um, and so delivering this to the central nervous system, either through uh, things like we talked about with um, gene therapy with AAV, um, if we build things that are, are synthetically based, uh, so these are nanoparticles that can, that can be constructed that contain the therapeutic cargo, and then also uh, approaches that we can do with um, using stem cells to deliver, uh, like we talked about or touched on uh, earlier in the introduction. And then we want to move this forward into the animal models of the disease. And so as we move into the animal models of disease, um, this kind of comes with uh, multiple caveats. And so one of the things that I think that our lab um, really uh, tries to strive for and really tries to focus on is we really wanna work on the human genetic condition. And so, uh, like we said uh, earlier, the, out of the, this entire, all of these base pairs, oh, I'm sorry, um, all of these different base pairs um, are unique to each gene and tend to also be relatively unique uh, to species. And so a mouse MECP2 uh, doesn't 100% uh, look like human MECP2. While a lot of it's conserved and the function looks very, very similar, um, a very specific genetic target uh, in a human uh, may not work at all in a mouse. And so what we do is we undergo these, uh, what we refer to, and I have it on the next slide, these uh, what we call bridging studies. And so how do we go from the human genome back to the mouse? And this is, I think, a, a paradigm that our lab is, is very focused on. Um, in the past, we've done things where we were trying to go to the mouse and then towards a human. Um, and I think that, that those turtles are, are maybe a little bit more challenging that we, if we focus uh, all of our effort early on into understanding whether or not these, uh, these types of interventions will be meaningful, uh, we start with the human genome. Um, but if we are successful in, in, in bridging back to the mouse and we find something that works within the mouse genetic condition, um, and then we start to do a lot of different assessments with the animal models of the disease. So if we can test, uh, you know, if the mice have phenotypes that resemble uh, the human condition, things like motor deficits or EEG abnormalities or, or cognitive deficits, um, can we test those in the mice? And then, or can we confirm that those exist in the transgenic mouse models that we would like to use? And then secondly, can we do, can we develop different interventions where we deliver gene therapy, where we deliver um, these different platforms that, that contain our therapeutic cargo and test to see really whether or not, um, you know, in the, in the cells in a dish, I think we use the terminology a lot called molecular rescue. And I think um, we've been able to show this in the past that uh, with the example that Julian's given in CDKL5 and uh, what we're very close to showing in MECB2 is that we can 
we can demonstrate that we can get uh, the gene of interest to be regulated in the, in the manner that we want it to. And we refer to that as a molecular rescue. But what it really, at the end of the day, I think the thing that we're the most interested in is understanding whether or not these will translate into functional rescues. So if we're able to reactivate or, or we can do a, um, an artificial escape of the healthy MECB2, um, and so the cell is producing a, a, um, a significant amount of MECB2, which we think would be therapeutically relevant, does that actually translate into functional recovery? Does that make, uh, one, the first step, does that make the mouse better? Does, do we hit enough cells within the mouse brain um, to, to make their function better? Can we get a functional rescue? And then hopefully with that, if we're able to achieve that, what that would translate into um, are what we call an IND enabling study. And so IND enabling studies, these are investigational new drugs. Um, and these are studies that we would uh, conduct with the guidance of the, the FDA to understand whether or not if we can achieve molecular rescue in human cells, if we can see functional rescue in an animal model of the disease, then we would talk to these regulatory agencies to understand, okay, what do we need to do um, in terms of safety, in terms of, of advancing these types of therapeutics. Um, and so uh, I'm gonna put this summary slide up and, and we'll go through this uh, relatively quickly. I think that um, uh, we've covered a lot of these different topics uh, throughout the, the uh, a little over an hour that we've been uh, talking so far, um, but really kind of summarizing what we're doing and, and kind of the future perspective in our, in our plan studies. And so um, as a lab, we're, we're very dedicated to, to understanding uh, MECP2. We're very um, focused on understanding how MECP2 uh, variants affect uh, functions in cells. And so, um, and then uh, within the context of this, can we do uh, what Julian talked about, can we induce an epigenetic escape of the healthy MECB2 um, in something that resembles a patient neuron? And so we have studies that are, are currently ongoing that are starting um, where we're looking at this, uh, the constructs and the targets for, for epigenetic escape. Uh, we have um, uh, induced pluripotent stem cells um, from very brave patients. Um, uh, that have Rett syndrome that have, have given uh, skin punch biopsies. Um, and I know that this is, this is a, um, a big ask of patients and families um, to basically to have your child have a, a chunk of their skin taken out um, and have a bandage and you know, maybe not be able to, to uh, swim or shower uh, for a few days while it's healing, but these are extremely powerful tools for us to use in the lab. Um, and so these iPSCs, we're, we're now differentiating into neurons to start testing these uh, these interventions for epigenetic escape. Um, we're also starting to do things uh, in the lab where we're looking at bridging these back to the mouse genome. So that uh, in the anticipation and, and uh, with the promising data that we have suggesting that epigenetic escape of MECB2 um, that has been shown by others as well as, uh, as us, um, that, that this will be a, a promising therapeutic to move forward. And then we were really gonna wanna look at things like that functional rescue um, in the mouse. So bridging back these targets to the mouse genome, as well as starting to address these things in terms of how do we deliver this. And so um, I'm a neuroscientist by training. I love neuroscience. I think a lot of uh, the students will ask me, Julian has asked me before, um, the brain is really hard to deliver things to. So maybe we should try an easier organ um, but I think that uh, once we can kind of unlock how we, how we access the brain, how we access uh, the, the brain cells within a patient um, will really open a lot of avenues for very powerful uh, potential therapeutics. Um, and then we'll be uh, doing these different assessments of functional recovery uh, with these diseases in a dish and transgenic mice. And we say functional here because uh, there's a lot of evidence in other publications that suggest that uh, even though um, we have uh, brain cells from a rat patient growing in a dish, and that's a very uh, artificial type system, that these cells actually may have some different types of functional deficits. And so uh, Alison Mutris uh, has shown and has some uh, wonderful data uh, demonstrating how uh, cells coming from uh, Rett syndrome patients uh, may differ from, from a healthy or a non uh, rat cell line. Um, and then as we start to move forward into to looking at mouse studies, uh, I think a question that always comes up and, um, you know, is, is when do we intervene? How do we intervene? Um, and then this last point, I think, is really uh, critical as we start to think about these different therapeutics is, is how efficacious can we be? How potent can these therapeutics be? 
Um, and then really the, the major question for us with a lot of these different kinds of things is what's the durability? And so we want something that following intervention uh, could, could last for, for the life of the patient. Um, that whatever type of epigenetic alterations or epigenetic editing or, or whatever we may be delivering um, will be uh, will be able to, to, to last for a long time. So there's they're not going in for report, rep, uh, repeated injections or, or multiple surgeries. Um, but we also know that this is a this is an extremely uh, challenging topic as well because we're talking about developing brains. And so as we grow, as we continue to age, our brain is likely undergoing these different types of dynamic alterations. And so really the question of durability and the long-term safety and efficacy of, of any of these approaches, uh, be it regular gene therapy or um, uh, types of epigenetic editing, which would likely uh, still exist in the world of gene therapy, um, I think are very, very important things to consider. And so with that, um, there's a lot of people that work on this uh, in my lab in, in, the, in the idea of, of epigenetic editing in terms of developing the, um, the types of, of editing cargo um, in terms of, of testing these and, and coming up with delivery platforms to, to put those into mice. Um, like I mentioned, uh, I've had uh, wonderful mentorship and collaborations uh, here at UC Davis um, within the Institute for Regenerative Cures with Dr. Jan Nolta, um, and then at the Genome Center, uh, Dr. David Siegel and, and his lab, Dr. Coggins and, and Ogin, um have been instrumental in really how we, we start to develop these different types of therapeutics. Um, and then uh, our lab here, I think uh, almost everybody on this list has uh, has touched uh, the RET cells or has worked within the, the epigenetic editing uh, for MECP2. Um, a couple of them, uh, for anybody that's uh, local, uh, Fiona and Cassiana uh, both came to the RET Education Day with us um, in the Bay Area last year. And I think we're really moved by, um, by meeting the families and, and getting to interact with uh, RETSyndrome.org, as well as um, you know the patients and understanding and hearing their stories and, and really getting to uh, convey the, the science that they're trying to work on. Um, and so with that, uh, I think we will conclude. And if there is there's any questions, we're happy to to answer them. Great. Well, uh, Dr. Frank and Julian, thank you so much for giving us uh, that really wonderful overview. This is a complex topic, uh, but one that, as you may guess, is very important to families uh, as there's a lot of hope that there may be a therapeutics uh, in this realm that you are talking about with gene therapy and gene editing. Um, so thank you very much for this overview. What we're going to do, we're going to go into the question and answer uh, session, and we have uh, just about 10 minutes left. And we're going to start with questions that were sent in in advance. Uh, and some of those I'll answer, some of them I'll, I'll ask uh, you to answer. Uh, and then we'll go to questions that have come in during the session if we have time. Uh, and just so that everyone is aware, if there's any questions that we don't get to today that were either sent in in advance or uh, through the chat session, uh, we will. Uh, be able to answer them uh, in writing and send that information out to all those that are registered. So first I wanted to start with, um, there were many questions related to what effects do we expect to see uh, with gene therapy? Uh, and this is really a burning question for all of us that have a family member that's affected. What 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 is it gonna do? What will my uh, child do? And really people were asking, will it impact cognitively, speech, motor, Will it change seizures? Uh, will it have any effect on central apneas? Uh, will it be complete symptom reversal? And the hard answer is that until we do a clinical trial and until this is actually used in humans, we don't know for certain uh, what we expect, what we will see in uh, our family members living with Rett syndrome. Um, so we really do need to wait for those clinical trials. Uh, you know, we can't take a mouse and say whatever the mouse does is what a human does. Certainly, you know, mice don't communicate verbally uh, like we do. And so we wouldn't be able to know if speech would be improved uh, based on the mouse study. And that is really why we need to uh, study this through a clinical trial. You know, we do anticipate that there are some aspects that likely will not be reversible. Um, so there may be structural changes. So if uh, you have a family member that has severe scoliosis, 
we wouldn't necessarily expect for that to correct itself and no longer uh, need a surgery that you may have been anticipating. Um, so there are some aspects uh, that we don't think would change uh, with, with uh, gene therapy. Another example is um, we know many of the uh, individuals affected have microcephaly, so their uh, head size is smaller than it is in the general population. And really that's a very early change where within two years of life, uh, the skull comes together, what we call the sutures that are in between the bones of your uh, head, they come together and they fuse. And so once that fusion occurs, we don't anticipate that the skull could grow anymore. I mean, in which case we wouldn't expect that microcephaly to change. And then the brain, of course, is in that skull. Um, so growth may be limited because of that skull uh, being fixed. All right. There was also questions uh, regarding age. Uh, you know, at what age will this be used? Is it something that can only be used prenatal or only with babies uh, or only with young children? Again, we don't know for sure until we do a clinical trial uh, because we don't know exactly what will improve. Uh, we do anticipate that we may see some benefit through uh, the lifespan of an individual. Uh, this is very different than the SMA clinical trial and now approved drug for type one, very severe uh, SMA, where those children actually have a very shortened lifespan. Um, so often by two years, two to three years of age, uh, they may uh, die due to their disease. And it's a neurodegenerative disorder. And so that's why that very early intervention is critical in that type of SMA. That is not the case with Rett syndrome. Um, and so that's why we may expect that even later in life, we do uh, still see some improvements from gene therapy. Uh, but Really, this is uh, looking into a crystal ball that we don't yet have until we do those clinical trials and know the impact. There was a question regarding if boys uh, would be potentially treated uh, with gene therapy and could they be in clinical trials? Uh, we would expect that um, you know boys may also benefit uh, from a gene therapy potentially if uh, girls were benefiting. And would they be involved in a clinical trial? Really, that is up to uh, the sponsors who are designing the, the clinical trials, and it's important to understand what's in, what the goal of a clinical trial is. It, if it's to show the impact, we need as uniform as a group as possible. Uh, and so that would really be up to the sponsors and um, the key opinion leaders that help the sponsors design that clinical trial. Um, so that is not a question that we can answer broadly, and it may be dependent on the actual trials. Finally, there's um, a lot of questions about when will a clinical trial be done in Rett syndrome. Uh, there was much anticipation about a clinical trial starting, and I just wanted to review some things that have happened so that we understand um, where the timeline has gone. And so as uh, we've talked about, SMA uh, gene therapy uh, was approved. This was on May 24th of uh, 2019. And like I said, this was for uh, children with a very severe type of SMA uh, that were less than two years of age. And they were given um, IV infusion one time. Uh, about a month later, in June of 28, the FDA did report um, that Avexis had reported to them a uh, data manipulation issue that impacts the accuracy of certain data from product testing performed in animals that was submitted to the FDA. Um, so this is from an FDA statement. And so because of that, uh, the FDA has requested that Avexis uh, relook at some of the animal uh, data before doing other clinical trials. Now a different uh, thing that occurred was in October of 2019, the FDA placed a partial clinical hold on a clinical trial called STRONG. Now, this was a clinical trial for older uh, children with SMA. Um, they had type 2 SMA, less severe, so they do live past that early childhood. And these children were getting intrathecal administration, so not IV. Now, for this clinical trial, there were three different doses. So there was a low dose and a mid dose, which had already completed uh, by the time in October. And then there was a higher dose cohort of individuals, and that's what was put on a partial clinical hold. 
Uh, so what they reported was that in a preclinical study, which means this was done in animals, not in uh, the human clinical trials, the dorsal root ganglia mononuclear cell inflammation was observed, and this led to neuronal cell body degeneration or loss. Um, so this is why the FDA has asked for uh, further information from uh, Novartis. We have heard uh, from Avexis that there would, uh, the company will uh, reevaluate in mid 2020. Um, so that is all the information we have as to when a clinical trial may begin to enroll for Rett syndrome. Uh, Someone also had asked specifically that S, uh, Stanford is already offering uh, gene therapy for SMA, um, but I hope now by understanding that a clinical trial has to occur in each different disease for which they are testing this, um, that that question has been answered as to why uh, our uh, family members cannot enroll in that same clinical trial or cannot get gene therapy just because uh, it's been approved for SMA only. Okay. Uh, so other questions, um, you know, we're going to have time for just one more question, and this really relates to what you were talking about, uh, Julian and, and Kyle. Why is CDKL5 reactivation further along than MECP2? Um, is there a medical or a scientific reason for this? So, so that's a, a, a great question, and, and the most uh, straightforward answer from us in our lab um, is we received an, a, a grant and an award to start working on CDKL5 before we started, uh, before we received a grant uh, from RETCentrum.org. And so, uh, the only reason that CDKL5 I think is a little bit further ahead, specifically in our lab. Um, it's just the time that we've been working on it. And so a lot of the, the uh, preliminary data that uh, Julian was able to generate in CDKL5 early on uh, was pilot data that we included uh, in our, our application to RETSyndrome.org to say, hey, we think this is a very promising um, approach. And so uh, what seems to be the case is, is the, the breakthroughs and the progress that Julian's made in CDKL5, uh, that MECB2 is catching up to it very quickly in terms of the establishment of techniques, the, uh, the tools that we're using. Um, and, and, and just as another statement, we're not the only ones that are, are potentially trying this approach with epigenetic alterations using this uh, for Rett syndrome. Um, so uh, Rudy Janish and, and Sean Liu have been doing the same approach um, and have made great progress. And, and, and we communicate with uh, them and we, we uh, got a chance to, to interact with them uh, at the Society for Neuroscience last year to understand kind of how what they're doing in MECB2, what they're observing in MECB2, and how that can educate what we're trying to do in MECB2. So kind of uh, learning from each other a little bit in terms of how we can uh, most rapidly uh, move this forward. Great, thank you for answering that. And um, it's great to hear about the collaboration among different uh, labs, really coast to coast. Uh, and so it's great to hear that you're collaborating with others so that we can advance this, learn from each other and get to the answers faster. So unfortunately we are out of time for more questions. Um, I am going to compile all the questions that have come in and uh, make sure that we get answers uh, from our researchers at UC Davis as well as any questions um, that I can answer. So we will get that out to uh, those registered attendees. And now I will hand it back over to the page. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, Dominique. Thank you, Dr. Fink. Thank you, Julian. We really appreciate your time with us today. Um, your, your commitment to your research is, is really uh, phenomenal. It's mind-blowing to me that we are where we are today, and we wish you the best of luck with your future endeavors. Thank you so much for spending the day with us this past summer at our Ed Day. You made quite an impact on our families, and through your presentation today, you have reached families across the U.S. and all around the world. We have families from um, many, many, many countries that uh, dialed in today at all times on the clock and in different time zones to hear about your exciting work. So we wish you uh, the best success and um, everyone in your field that is working with you and under your mentorship, I know will benefit from your, your continued work. So thank you. Um, to our attendees, I'm going to 
bring the screen back to me here. There we go. And to our attendees, uh, we have families, clinicians, researchers, other professionals. We hope that you found value in today's session and that the knowledge you learned here today will give you hope, inspire you, and empower you in ways great and small in your path forward. It's very complex. We're making exceptional progress and being very careful along the way. Um, our children are at the center of all of this work. So as before we leave, my request to you is that all, especially families, try your best to understand how to advocate for our mostly nonverbal children and to understand that there is a lot of support for all of your efforts, whether it's in your day-to-day -day quality of life or uh, in your fundraising efforts for research or anywhere in between. You can rely on RitSyndrome.org, um, our sponsors, our supporters to help you along your way. Um, in the idea of making progress in research, um, I want to bring back the, I, you to the idea that there are things that you can do today and participate in today while we are waiting for these wonderful clinical trials to come to fruition. As you know, there's a burden of illness survey that is open. You've seen it in our newsletters, on our website, and our social media feeds, and we ask that you take um, take some time to take that survey, and please reach out to any clinicians that are working with your children that maybe have seen three or more children with Rett syndrome and ask if they too would participate in the study. There is a professional version, uh, or a version for professionals. It's all done online. You'll be compensated for your time, and the results of this survey will be used as evidence in advocating for services support, treatment, and really important, especially as we look towards the, the cost of gene therapies, will be used for consideration for authorizations and reimbursements moving forward. So please visit um, this website, voicesofret.org, and you'll get instructions for accessing the survey. So finally, we believe that information on our rare disorder should be free to all who avail themselves of it. So we do appreciate our sponsors and supporters of our education programming for RettSyndrome.org. We have a great slate of topics coming forward in 2020. We'll continue to bring research topics to our monthly webcasts. We hope that you join us next month on March 10th at 1 p.m. Eastern, same, same date and time. Um, to hear about walking and ambulation and Rett syndrome with um, Dr. Mayor Lotan, who comes with us from Israel and has been doing uh, years and years of work in this area. We have four in-person Ed Days coming up across the country uh, this year. Starting in June, we'll be in Baltimore, Maryland at Kennedy Creek. Uh, if you're on the East Coast, we hope that you visit our website and find uh, registration information to join us in Baltimore. And um, if the East Coast isn't your, uh, in your reach, join us on the West Coast in Vancouver, Washington on August 15th. We'll be back um, on the other seaboard, September 19th in, Green, in South Carolina. It'll either be Greenwood or um, Charlotte. We'll, we're still working on the city and location, but it will be September 19th. And we'll be in Chicago in the Midwest on October 10th. Lots of opportunities to meet with RettSyndrome.org, meet with the experts at the clinics associated with these cities, and um, we'll have researchers in those regions also come and give some um, additional talks on clinical trials and research. Uh, a fun opportunity for us all to get together and take a little vacation and learn to live a life without limits. We'll be in San Diego, June 18 to 21. We'll be doing some great things, going to Legoland together. We have an adapted surf school organized on Saturday, um, June 20th for everyone living with the diagnosis of Rett syndrome. And um, look for the Facebook group and for more details about that. And we hope to see you at any one of these locations. And if we can't meet with you in person, we hope to see you online with our further Rhett Ed webcasts. All of this uh, calendar and dates can be found on RettSyndrome.org for families slash education. So that concludes our webcast today. And again, thank you to all of our wonderful, wonderful presenters, our wonderful attendees, and thank you, Dr. Pichard, for facilitating our call today. Have a great day, evening, and we'll talk to you again soon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Have a great day.